Good morning. We will call the meeting to order. First item is the approval of the agenda. Move to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Carried. No citizens to be heard. Approval of minutes of July 2nd and July 9th, 2013. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Carried. Um, Nate, you're on. We will go to you. Assistant County Attorney. Uh, I, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I think we need to wait for that appropriate time for this one. Uh, there was a lot of media interest in a portion of it. Now. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we will wait, uh, Nate, until that time. Uh, at this time, we will can we have a couple of committee reports. <clears throat> Frank? Okay. I just had soil, the soil and water conservation district. Uh, there is start getting concerns about the budget and stuff like that. Is about their main concern there in that one. Um, yeah. Who is that? Who is that? Uh, which, which soil and water conservation. You know, they submitted their budget too, where they're getting increases in rent and stuff. So, other than that, uh, just attended the fair for a couple of days. Said, John. Uh, yeah, the um, last week after our board meeting, we had a hobby tracking meeting again, and uh, we, uh, no, is mm -hmm. that after? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had swack before it, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we uh, continued to to work on uh, some of the things that will be presented here with the, you know, later today here, the wheelage, wheelage tax and the... Uh, and the five-year road construction plan. So I think we'll hear about it all in a little bit. That evening uh, was the Ag Subcommittee for the diversion, and we spent most of the time talking there about uh, about the insurance, uh, crop insurance uh, uh, that uh, that we'd be offering to the farmers uh, uh, in the flooded, in the staging area, and uh, when whenever the 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 diversion is used, the uh, Crop insurance, federal crop insurance wouldn't cover, won't cover the, the losses. So there has to be some kind of a assurance that the farmers will be covered during those those times when the uh, crop insurance does not cover. And, and of course, it's not going to be a big deal if we only get to, you only use it once in ten years. And but we don't know uh, how often it would be would be used. And, and it's a complicated uh, thing because you, with crop insurance, if you get zero production some years, you. Uh, you know, you lower what you can then insure yourself for the next year. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a complicated uh, system, and we're trying to figure out. We can sounds like we can buy riders to the existing insurance. Uh, the authority could buy a rider uh, on it. Uh, they also could self-insure and uh, pay out uh, directly if there's a, a loss. And uh, I think the farmers involved would prefer there be a rider because they would trust the, the, the power of a company over the over the taxing. Uh, Authority here, so uh, th that's still to be worked on. Uh, we also then uh, on uh, the fair was the primary thing for me last week, but we had a uh, number of other things as well. There was a uh, uh, meeting with the Heritage Society for on the fundraising committee for the new uh, project, and we're about to enter in a two thousand or a two million dollar fund cam funding campaign for exhibit and other things. Uh, there was also a land management uh, meeting with the diversion uh, and the authority meeting as well uh, last Thursday. And uh, with land management, we were covering the, the normal things that we've gone over each each time, but they did present uh, uh, some of what we had worked on with the Ag Subcommittee uh, on the Tuesday night. All day on, uh, on Friday, I was involved with the Lakes and Prairies Community Action Planning, long-term planning. Uh, Wayne was also at that, and uh, it was a it was a good day that to to look at uh, realities of the what the cap agencies are are facing with the cutbacks and and uh, looking at some new possibilities for funding uh, together with uh, United Way and uh, and the Impact Foundation and so on. So there's some some uh, encouraging thoughts there for some future collaborations that might be that might work. Um, at the fair, there was the uh, the uh, Century Farm presentation that was made at noon on, or one o'clock on uh, on Sunday, and uh, otherwise all the normal 
normal activities of the fair. It was, I think, a good fair. There was, <coughs> it was hot and did rain some, but uh, it was, uh, I think, pretty good, uh, pretty good turnouts and a good celebration of the hundredth year. So that was, uh, that was all positive. So that's all. We will go back to the regular agenda at this time, and um, Darren Brook, Jennifer Pearson, long-term disability. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? <coughs> Thank you. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. I need to start the day off with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to uh, let Jennifer run with this one. She's kind of headed up this whole project here and uh, brought it to the insurance committee. And so I'll turn okay. it over to you. Well, um, and Mr. Chair, in the uh, packet that we sent out was a memo simply um, indicating that we have received word from our agent of, uh, <coughs> agent of record, which is Oaks Inc., or the municipal pool, who administers our current long-term disability product through Assurant. Um, and they had received some high rate increases from Assurant to certain members of the municipal pool that they weren't comfortable passing along to the members, so they went out and did a formal request for proposal uh, to see what other offerings were out there. The final two that came back to them were Assurant as well as a company called Madison National Life. They did do final um, interviews with both companies and did come out with Madison National Life as offering them uh, rates that they could um, pass on to their customers that were a little bit better than Assurant. Um, they are also going to match the contract that we currently have with Assurant. Also, we gave them a census um, of our employees, and they did come back with a 15% rate reduction as well with the current rates that we have. That would actually go into effect with the contract if it's approved as of August 1st of this year. And then those rates would be guaranteed through January 1st of 2016. And then going forward, of course, we'd be re-rated accordingly with uh, two-year contracts. So we did bring this to the insurance committee, and we did uh, bring their recommendation of moving over to Madison National and signing a contract with them. We'd like to bring that forward to the board for final approval. Today? <coughs> yeah. Uh, the, um, one of the questions, if an employee um, selects to purchase a long-term uh, benefit, um, If that employee were to leave the county, can they continue to own that policy? It is portable. Yeah, okay, it is they portable. can take it okay. with them. <coughs> they just sign up through okay. them. Which they is would. pretty important, I think, mm -hmm. to, to have that option. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we, um, our insurance committee, um, did go through this, and I think it kind of passed uh, unanimously amongst us that. Um, that we should move forward with this, and so if uh, there's no other comments, I would move that we approve the change. No second. Discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion is carried. Thank I you. Have, Thank I have you. a question on the insurance too. Uh, the our dental insurance changed. Not yeah, changed right. Well, Did, the, was it automatic? Uh, dental Service Corporation. They're actually discontinuing. They're dissolving. They're dissolving. Yeah. So basically, Blue Cross. Blue Shield of North Dakota, which kind of was DSC, kind of went in the same. So we use the they same, took same over. cards and everything. I mean, yeah. we didn't get new cards. I don't no. think. Did no, no, no. They just um, Blue Cross Blue Shield just took over for DSC. Will continue as DSC offered, and then at the first of the year, of course, the, the new renewal will come. But we didn't have any changes, and if we have new cards, that would be at the first of the year if we just <coughs> sign with Blue Cross North Dakota going forward. Yeah, I'm just wondering if her old cards were still. Yep. Viable, so. yes. Are we getting any information back yet on health insurance, what the increase may be? Or We're scheduled August to receive 13th. that on August 13th. Are you hearing anything yet? That it's going to go higher? Well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't, let's say we haven't officially heard anything, but um, it's, um, well, we don't know. And in, in August 13th is when we'll find out our new rates. So. Um, I don't anticipate it going down at all, <laughs> I'll say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, can we go to you for your PDA report? Okay. Yeah. Um, we're just a little early and you, uh, you let's said see. we should wait. Well, yeah, I just, you know, I'm just 
just the one item on there I know was all over the news last week, so I figured they might oh, want to be here today. So, um, Again, we had the highway tracking meeting <coughs> after last week's board meeting, of which uh, those topics uh, we'll get into further discussion on, on them here today. Um, the Diversion, Diversion Authority outreach meeting uh, was held last Wednesday. And of course, there was uh, discussion at that meeting regarding uh, the need to probably better inform all of the uh, commissions and councils who were members of this, uh, just judging by the um, questions that were raised in, in light of the new um, design agreement that the Morehead City Council had, there was clearly um, a lack of information that was being provided. So I think we're going to do a, try to do a better job in getting out to, and that would be also then including maybe a quarterly report to each of the boards, which would be also this county board. And that would probably come from our, our project design team. And then on the diversion authority itself, that was again the primary discussion was on, on those issues and um, getting ready. We'll be moving forward with the <coughs> the design agreement did was approved by, by both Fargo and Moorhead, so that is moving forward. The next step now will be to make the next amendment to the joint uh, powers ag uh, agreement, which <coughs> um, stipulates what the funding would be for the calendar year 2014, <coughs> which actually runs from September of this year to August of next year, I believe, is the date that that works. And, <coughs> and um, our side of the river has made it clear that um, we want to make sure that there, the language is, is in there that whatever we pay up from where we share those costs with the city right now in terms of a contribution to that, that that is uh, the only payment that we're committed to, um, you know, until the legislature would do otherwise and that we would have no further financial commitment uh, because of our lack of being able to raise funds like North Dakota and Cass County and Fargo has. So. So we're going to make sure that that, um, that language is inserted and I've talked with the Diversion Authority Chairman and, and he understands that and I think we shouldn't have any problem getting that to our satisfaction. And that is, um, that's all I have Mr. Chairman. Chief, oh, Brian Chairman, if I may, <coughs> at that meeting, Moorhead did speak. <coughs> There was about a 20 minute discussion mm -hmm. in regards to, and, 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 and uh, uh, Commissioner Campbell did address that as well. And I thought did just an extremely good job of balancing everybody's feelings out on that. You did just a very good job of explaining Thank you. that. That was a large group and an important presentation. He showed support for Moorhead, but yet he, he showed the importance of moving forward. And I, I was just impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Chief. <coughs> Uh, let's see, I, last week I had uh, a Greater Fargo Mar EDC Executive Committee and we had updates on all the things they've got going on, which is quite a bit. Uh, one of the things they talked about was a small manufacturer that's looking, ha has been looking anywhere from Clay County all the way out to Jamestown, North Dakota, and it uh, sounds like they've kind of narrowed it down to either Barnesville or Castleton, so I thought that was good news that, you know, somebody on the Minnesota side isn't running for for that. Um, and then yesterday I had a uh, meeting of the area agency on aging and uh, our main, you know, we had discussed a lot of things there too, but sequestration is, you know, taking a toll on uh, services to the elderly and, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, each, we have nine counties in the West Central uh, region here and uh, we talked about you know our, our contributions and and uh, you know to to maintain things the way they were we need a 17 percent increase which isn't you know in terms of dollars isn't a lot but we kind of agreed that uh, what we would propose to our counties is a 10 percent increase because we figured we you know some of that pain is going to have to be felt it's just the way it is and. Uh, a 10% increase for Clay County, it's based on population out of those nine counties and uh, 
Of course, our, our senior population is the highest of those nine counties with the exception of uh, Otterdale. Tale. And uh, for us, the 10% uh, increase would, uh, would mean um, about a $600 increase for, for the year and what we contribute. So that was it for me. Mr. I just w just want to make a comment and follow regarding the economic development part of it, and I and I, I just think it would be nice to congratulate Morad and in, in getting their this new hotel that's uh, coming into Morad. I thought that was a there was they were in quite competition with um, West Fargo on that, and I I think the fact that uh, um, the city and the county and the school district we had gotten together to uh, create some incentives. To bring businesses here, I think it's, it's that's the first step in showing that that can pay off. And I just wanted to congratulate Morit and the Morit More Business Association, who was also pushing for it. So. Good, thank you. On Friday, July 12th, at Lakes and Prairies uh, Board of Directors meeting, John spoke on that. Um, the only thing I would add to that, for the, under the director's report, there was a great deal of discussion regarding Head Start. Then on July 10th, I was in Ada and I stopped at the uh, Wild Rice Watershed District meeting. was there for about an hour and uh, most interesting. I guess you and I were at the Morgan picnic too. Yes, we were. Yeah, yep. Great time. We were, we were, were at Lawrence party. Mm -hmm. yeah, very good. Well done. Nate, the cameras are here. You're on. <laughs> <laughs> the cameras are on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nathan Gannon, our assistant county engineer, has three items for us to go over, and the third one is rather interesting. Fire away, Nate. Good morning. Good morning. I guess we'll start with the first item, um, and that would be uh, review and, and approval of the uh, five-year county construction plan. It will look, look very familiar to you as, as when we did the bonding. The first three years of the bonding uh, projects are all included in this. So uh, that these years, the first three years will be very similar. Um, 2013 is well underway so that the projects that you see on the first page um, are all under construction or will be shortly under construction. Um, the, the dollar values that are, that are listed in the estimated costs have been updated to today's uh, construction estimates based on overruns and, and changes to the projects. Um, things are going very well in, in this year's construction. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of major overruns, um, just, uh, just one on, a, on one of the overlay projects of about $100,000. You have County 17 out there, but West of Linden, is county, isn't County 17 being redone too? Yep. It is, it's, right. it's project number um, Two and two, three. actually two. <clears throat> the three is a, a bridge replacement, and that's oh, actually high, okay. There it is on the side. I'm looking at the on location. Excuse me. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. The first the first column is project number. Then the second column is the highway. Is that going <coughs> to be going on next month, or when is that going on? Is someone concerned about the Glendon uh, parade because uh, they line up on that road? When when is the Glendon parade? And it's the second week in August. Okay. No, it doesn't have anything to serve me or stuff here, but um, yeah. they line up on that road, I know. So. Okay. Well, one thing that we could do, um, the contractor, as a part of that project, the contractor is also going to be overlaying 2, 11, 31, um, the box culvert on 19, so there might be a, a way to shift around a little bit to make sure that we're not there at the same time. This will be about the same time frame that this project will be going on. It's on Saturday, so they probably wouldn't be working, but it's a matter of being the road being available. So. They're, they're actually behind, and that's why they're not already here. So there's a good chance that they will be working on Saturday. Okay. But um, now that I know that, that that's the second weekend in August. I, I'd have to check for sure, but, um, yeah. And, and we can make sure that we don't conflict. Very good. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> So, so, like I said, 2013 is, is pretty well set. And we're, all the projects are in, in, under contract. 2014, this will be our, our large grading year. 
Um, we'll be grading County 18 from State 75 all the way out to a mile east of, of County 11. About five and a half miles. It, that'll be probably our main major project in, in that year, um, prepping it for asphalt paving in 2015. County 52 is also on the on the project and then be the south end where we tie in from Trunk Highway 9 up to Clay County 55. That'll be another grading project um, right around the, the Barnesville Airport. And then we've got County 3 um, past the uh, past the courthouse and the Family Services Center here. That'll be a mill and overlay. We'll start it down at Center Avenue and take it all the way up to County 18. Uh, you can see the funding on that project is shown at half. We are anticipating 50% of the funding for that project to come from the City of Moorhead. We have talked to them about this. They're in agreement. We need to go out and do some more scoping work on it to, to refine the details of the project, but the concept is, is essentially set as to what we're going to be doing there. <laughs> Nathan, on that project, there's there's nothing underground that Moorhead would need to do prior to us doing that, is there? They haven't indicated that they would have anything. There may be some residents along um, County 3 that probably could or would want to look at doing their individual sewer lines and making sure that their connections are good. Um, we've been to, in talks with the city of Moorhead to, to get a letter put out so that that could be done um, beginning this fall and, and up to the project start. That would be the only underground unless, um, unless we run into problems with the storm sewers. We haven't run a camera through them yet. That, that would be the only other thing. I've got two questions. One about okay. the crossing the railroad. Uh, is the railroad uh, on, on deck with us, or isn't there a? If we're starting at Center Avenue, we go. Okay, we we would have to get a permit from them to do that, and and we we do that typically. But on don't they projects. do the the work actually, or maybe they're already done what they need to do there? Uh, no, we would we would tracks and so on. we would we would run our mill right up to the tracks, and then we would we would mill that material away and, and pave it back in. We do that on, on a lot of our projects. We're doing it on 17 this year in, in Glendon, and we're doing it up in Georgetown as well. All the contractor has to do is apply for some uh, railroad protective liability insurance. Uh, we go through, it's about a six to eight week process to notify them and get approval. Okay. So. The other question is on, the, I mean, it's a long stretch of city, city street uh, there. Are we uh, doing cur any of the curb and gutter or is there? That's another part of the scoping that, that we've uh, been looking at. That, that one of the benefits of having all the rain that we did earlier this year is we've been able to go out and identify some of the small problem areas. So we will be removing some of the curb and gutter in that area to, to provide drainage on the street. Okay. That, uh, does that road stay open then when you're doing that? That's something that we need to consider. Um, in the first about eight blocks, we'd be looking at doing a mill down in the existing concrete, and that would leave a four first, inch. You're going south to north now. South to north, sorry. Okay. I, yep, I always okay. talk south to north. Okay. Um, so you, you're correct. So from, from about Center Avenue north, uh, I think the cutoff is, is Close to up at the school near the courthouse. There's old concrete. There's four inches of asphalt over the top of that. <clears throat> the problem that we have with milling all of that off at, at one time and then paving it back in is you could end up with, with a, a drop-off problem from, from one lane to the other. Um, generally, we, we try not to have that. We would probably keep it open during, during construction, um, but the exact phasing and staging of it, we haven't identified yet. But it would probably be open during construction. Would the plans for that could it be done by the time school starts up here? That would, yes. We would definitely try and, and phase the project so that we didn't start before school ended, and we got we got done before it started in the fall. Because this gets to be quite wild out right out here once that school opens up. Yeah. And, and that's yeah, that's part of our staging. We we have a little bit more work to do on the staging on that project yeah. to, 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 yeah. to come up with it. But, yeah. Yep. Uh, Two thousand fifteen. After we complete the grading. Uh, down on Highway 52 from County or from Trunk Highway 9 up to uh, to County 55, we would then place the concrete um, from 9 up to 55, and then also we would include the unbonded overlay section um, from th where we left off on County 21 down to 55.
to, to finish that that entire stretch of, of roadway off from uh, from basically Saban all the way down to Barnesville. We would, we would have that completed. Um, we would also pave the uh, concrete um, on the stretch that we graded the year prior from Trunk Highway 75 out to one mile east of 11. Um, and at the same time, as, and even though it's shown as a separate project, uh, the project 17 and 18 would be tied together and we would complete uh, from County 3 to State 75. Uh, we have some subgrade repair to do out there, which would just basically be some areas that we've seen failure in. We would go in, repair those, remove the asphalt, um, and then pave uh, concrete in there as well. That's the area right along the beet plant? That's right in front of the beet plant, correct. Yep. So. I would guess we'd have some celebrating in Burnsville once that's the <laughs> what, and once Baker and <laughs> And say, but it's when once that road is done. So yeah, I think it's good. it was uh, probably think five years ago. We didn't think we stood a chance to figure out a way to get right. it done. So there's been a lot of good work done to make that work. I think Wayne uh, told me he was going to take O52 on the way home from Barnesville. Did you have courage enough to do that? Yeah. I did. Uh, You're still shaking a little bit. Save the county a couple of dollars a mile. Yeah, okay. <laughs> short. 2016. Um, let me see here. Something. Two thousand sixteen. Um, one thing to mention too in, in two thousand project number 20 and, and project number 16, which aren't projects, that kind of shows the, the bond payment going back in. So if you see that in there, um, you know, that's, that kind of gives you an indication of when we're going to start paying off that bond. And, and that will start um, in 2014 with $850,000 as shown in, uh, in project 16. Project 20 would be the second bond payment and that would be a million twenty-five thousand. So mm -hmm. I, I failed to mention that. So. 2016 is the year when, when our bond projects will all have been completed and we'll start to do the payoff process. Um, what we're looking at doing in these years is to, uh, uh, to utilize some of our, our bridge bonding um, funding through the state and replace a couple of culverts. Uh, one would be down on County 56 um, and then the other one would be down, would be on County 67 in Kurtz Township, uh, they're, they're smaller bridge replacements projects. What we would typically, what we typically do with these is we would tie them in with four to six additional um, township box culvert replacement projects, so we could get a bigger bang for our buck and um, and help lighten the burden for the for the townships on the cost of those projects. Um, County 95, we're also showing uh, grading. Um, two miles of County 95. We would start one mile north of 18 and, and go to three miles north of, of 18. That's the section where we've got the, uh, the Odyssey on right now. Um, and by then it'll, it'll be definitely time to, to remove that, that surface and, uh, and grade it. Does that take us to 93 or does that take us to, no, it goes further than that. That's a ticket right to 22. 22. Takes to it goes, uh, yeah, we'll go no, 22 is what oh, takes us to 22? Takes us to 22, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's two miles. Two miles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. No, that isn't right. Let me just steal the map behind your head. It take us from here up to. Essentially, we're 93 ties into 75. Yeah. I was off here, right? One mile north of uh, one mile north would be the term I have 22. So right to the intersection of 93. Yeah, yeah right where the the developments Anderson. Anderson, Anderson yeah. That's, right. That's the same stretch that was on the seal previously. Yep. We're starting to see a lot of a lot of areas where that is blown out. So. By, uh, by 2016, it'll be definitely time to remove it and replace it. And that one, you can see we're, we're utilizing our county road funding on that. So that's where that $700,000 is coming in there. So 
one thing to note, um, in order for us to make this plan work, you know, all the way through our, our new county construction allotment, the green money, that has been held at 350000 um, in the first three years of the plan. And, and I think, Kevin, wasn't it maybe a few years before where it went from three hundred to 350? Right. So we've, we've built that up a little bit. Um, in order to make the plan work, in order to be able to do this project and subsequently um, the, the next year's project where we're grading the, the remaining three miles, um, we propose uh, increasing the uh, new, county allot new county construction allotment from 350 to 400 for these last two years um, to help, to help uh, fund uh, the grading work that needs to be done out there and subsequently the, the eventual paving work that will need to be done as well. So, any questions about 2016? Well, I, I, Mr. I, the, the comment on the, um, on the allotment, you know, right now, you know, to make it all work, we would, we, that future board, future boards, we can't do that today. We can't set the 400 for today for what's going to be in 17, but Certainly, this kind of sets the stage as how it would be funded, okay. and there's always there's always um, opportunities, and maybe there's always some downfalls that can change that up or down. You know, we have some good bids, and you have some bad bids. You have mm -hmm. overruns and stuff, but but uh, right now, based on what we know, you know, we're going to be talking about something else down the road here that might allow some additional funds available too that could maybe uh, make sure. a case for not having to do that as well. But, yeah. okay. but it's just something that, that's more informational now. Yeah. We can't be making that decision for future boards as far as okay. that point of view. I, I just wanted to, to demo to, to show what I right. wasn't meaning you're, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, to make one thing too that, that uh, we've talked about uh, the highway tracking committee is uh, is that we think we could get a better bid if we did all the grading the five miles at the same time rather right. than split it in two years. And uh, so if there's some way that we end up with extra extra funds, uh, more funds than we have here, then we could maybe do that in one shot rather than two. I, not only for the bid, but also for just the, uh, mm -hmm. the difficulty in living along it. It's, it's going to be a lot better if it was all done one time. So. Correct. Um, with our current funding, this is the way it comes up. So in, in 2017, um, once again, we're, we're looking at uh, a bridge replacement with a box culvert on uh, County Road 68. Um, majority of that funding, again, is coming from bridge bonding. The, the local match would basically be to remove the old bridge and, and a few other minor grading items. Um, and then Project 26 is, is kind of the big one that uh, John and Kevin were alluding to. Be the remaining three miles would be the, the first mile from County 18 to a mile north, and then the north two miles starting at Anderson Addition, um, kind of County, yep, up to 26. Um, and on that we we're showing about a half million dollars worth of grading on that one as well. Um, and then we've got a uh, bridge replacement in there also on County Road 117. That's the one that's right in town, um, Frank. That's the bridge that's right in town, um, yeah, okay. the culvert there. We would be replacing that one. Um, we're starting to see some signs of deterioration on that one. Things are, are moving around. We're starting to lose some of the asphalt around it. It's, um, it's starting to suck through when the water moves through the culvert, so, or when the water moves through the bridge. So we'd replace it with a culvert. So, and again, that, that project would be funded mainly with bridge bond funds. And again, there's another... Project 28 would be another uh, full bond payment, the 2.235. Okay. Um, what are your wishes, gentlemen, regarding approval of the five-year road construction plan? I, I would move that we accept the plan as presented. No second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Your plan is carried. And next part. Okay, the next item um, is a resolution um, for the I-94 corridor expansion. Um, in the uh, Minnesota State 
highway investment plan. Um, the the St. Cloud uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, uh, has sent out um, to a lot of the, the counties up and down the I-94 corridor uh, requesting uh, support um, th for, for their resolution uh, to uh, uh, request that MnDOT consider expansion of the, the corridor uh, in the St. Cloud region specifically. Um, I, I think, Kevin, you wanted to talk about this one a little bit, correct? Yeah, well, um, and we certainly, through our highway tracking committee, we, we originally um, supported, supported this, but um, recent developments, we, uh, and I think I might have gotten that through you, Brian, or, uh, but an email from came from, or there was a request from the city in COG uh, to maybe consider holding off on this resolution, resolution until we can maybe come up with some joint language that COG, City of Moorhead, and the county can all um, live together with and so that we're all on the same message because right now there may be some language in here that COG or Moorhead might be struggling a little bit with. So I, I think it would be worth our while uh, to po postpone this for at least a week and and hear from COG and Moorhead and, and if we can get, come with a unified message, that's even all the better. Um, so I, I don't know if there's any anything earth-shattering that makes us need to do it today. Is there anything? No, there isn't. I think it, it could be um, tabled until we get some more information. Okay. Brian, is that kind of what the message was from COG? And yeah, yes, yes. The uh, chair and uh, Commissioner Campbell, they, they just, uh, you know, it's two different districts that we're dealing with, with uh, MnDOT. So postpone this for another, at least another week. I, I would move that we table this item. Well, there's really nothing to table because there's nothing on there. There's no motion to table, so we'll just postpone it. Okay. okay. Uh, next is the uh, Willard's tax. <coughs> Kevin, are you going to go into that one? Why? Well, okay. Yeah. As you guys may be aware, um, this last legislative session, um, the legislature approved uh, the ability, I guess, for all 87 counties to impose a village <coughs> tax. Um, prior to the uh, 2013 legislative session, only the seven metro counties were able to impose a village tax <coughs> for highway improvements on, on their roads. At, at that time, the tax was $5 per, per vehicle. Um, the new legislation allows county to, uh, to increase that up to ten dollars per vehicle. Um, you know, we, we we have there are some restrictions on that motorcycles. Uh, you can see their trailers, uh, collector cars, and, and some other things are exempt. Um, we we did bring this item to the last two highway tracking committee meetings uh, for discussion. There was an ex extensive discussion about um, the additional funds and, and what they would be put to use for and, and how they could help the county, um, you know, and, and or possibly offset some of the other costs that, that uh, you know, that we're, we're seeing tax dollars, uh, levy dollars spent on. Um, you know, at the present time, we do get uh, gas tax and license um, tab fees, you know, that are distributed back to us from the state, but they can only be spent on state aid roads. Um, the wheelage tax funds could be spent on on any roads um, within the county, um, as defined in in uh, the state's constitution. Um, and I've got, I've got a copy of that if you'd like to take a look at it. it basically, it's it's any county state aid highway system, municipal state aid road, um, or local road. Is there any timeline that uh, the money has to be spent? If money is collected in no, say 2013. No, no, can, the, the fund it, could be a revolving or okay, okay, fund can build. Yep. Thank you. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, as Nathan said, we we had extensive discussions uh, on this in the highway tracking committee meeting. And first off, is whether should you or should not should you not do it. Uh, um, I think Grant had given a report that several counties were were not doing it in, in the state, but. Um, when you look at the dollars that this would generate, and we're talking about $450,000 roughly a year in revenue that would 
be raised. I, you know, I'm speaking myself as a commissioner, and you, the rest of you can probably join in, but if there are complaints to county commissioners, the number one complaint that I seem to get seems to be about it's either roads or water, uh, one of those two issues. And, and um, obviously, whether I'm driving in the streets as the city of Morehead or I'm driving on the county roads or township roads, um, there's a lot of them that, that just need a lot of work. And our options for revenue, like Nathanstead, the, the certain state money that comes in, it's designated for state aid highway systems and so on and so forth, so we can't use those. So you're really boiled down to your other option is to uh, put it on a levy, which then goes to property tax. And um, in this particular case, the money that would be raised, 450000 that would be equivalent to almost a 2% increase on our levy. Um, when you look at um, the big picture and how I've talked about how, how we need to make sure um, that we're cognizant of what's going on on the other side of the river for future development and coming in here that we need to be reasonable with our, our um, what we do with our property tax. Uh, this would not go on the property tax. I've never heard of somebody who's trying to decide whether they're going to build a home or a business in Fargo more. I'd say, well, gee, how much am I paying for my car license uh, as, I, as they might be comp saying how much they're going to be paying in property tax. So, so that, you know, it, it, um, we need work on our roads, desperately need work on our roads. Um, and I think most of the citizens realize that. And this uh, resolution states that it has to go only uh, to, it, it's to be deposited into the road and bridge fund and used for those purposes only. During the Highway Tracking Committee meeting, I also uh, talked a little bit about having to understand where a lot of these dollars will be coming from. And a lot of these dollars will be coming from uh, residents of Moorhead, residents of Barnesville, residents of Glendon, Dilworth, and so on and so forth. And, and so, and they all have, they all have road issues and needs themselves. And so, you know, it was brought up that maybe we could do a shared system of this, of this increased revenue. Uh, in other words, we could set I think the resolution that one of the resolutions you have before is 30% is would be set aside into a fund that would allow cities to apply for funds for projects that they have in their area provided that they would put a match to it. So, so we're trying to get more things done with the amount of money that we have. Does Moorhead fall into that? Moorhead falls into that okay. as well. Thank you. Yeah. So it's all communities. What would still need to be worked out uh, through, the, you know, through the Highway Tracking Committee would be how, how do you proportionately uh, reserve some of that 30% for the different communities to make sure that everybody gets a piece of the pie, I, I think is kind of how we want to do that. And that, we just did not have the time in the Highway Tracking Committee meetings to this point to come up with that criteria, but it would be the intent to do that. But that doesn't have to be done today. No. The resolution is today, and that can be worked as out. As far as I'm concerned, sure. the resolution before I would before I would before I would agree to the resolution on the wheelage tax, I'd want assurance that the other resolution that does the split also passes, because I wouldn't be in favor of one without the other. When that comes to that, why don't we do that one first? Then? Okay. So, but I, I just, I, you know, a little bit of background there, and, and you know, and, and Mr. You know, Ms. Chairman, you, you raised the question, well, can you, is there a time limit on when you have to do this? And one of the, one of the options that we do have is we, we can allow um, these funds, if we so choose, to build so that you can do a significant project. You know, you wait three or four years, and all of a sudden you've got a million dollars, and you can you can do a fairly significant project for the county and for for these local communities. But uh, th this is, um, I know it's probably going to upset some people, but um, if we're going if they want us to fix these roads, um, we can't fix it with play money, and so we've got to we've got to come up with a source of revenue to do it, and and this seems to be. 
one that will keep us competitive with the other side of the river and um, allow future work to get done. Uh, John? Yeah, I would like just like to comment too on it. I mean, I think it's, this is a, an opportunity for us to to raise money that can be used on local roads that we haven't haven't had in the past, and it's uh, it's it's just vitally important that we keep our roads up. If our infrastructure continues to fail, we don't uh, we can't get uh, crops to market. We can't get uh, supplies uh, in and out of the county, and uh, the roads are in many cases in pretty tough shape right now. So we need right. to to do what we can to get them uh, up. I think this is a good idea. I'm I, I, I'm concerned about the the rural roads. Uh, but uh, I'm con convinced that we also need to uh, we need to make a, a share of this, a part of this, go into the cities uh, as well. And uh, with this kind of a, an approach, where we allow them to apply for matching funds to their own, I think that's a good. Uh, I also support it. Any other comments, gentlemen? Well, I reluctantly support it. Uh, I mean, yesterday at that meeting, I didn't. Out of the nine counties that were there, uh, I. None had decided to approve this wheelage tax, and Otter Tail had already decided against it. And uh, you know, like I said before, I think it's uh, I don't you know the reason I'll support it is I don't think we have any options. But uh, you know, I think it's again a failure at the state level to do their job. And you know, I, I see that's basically what it says in our resolution. So, and because of that, I'll I'll support okay. it. Kevin, do you want to make that motion? Well, the first I, one. You know, I. I yeah, right. We don't have a resolution for the second. We, there we, go. we do. Yep. We do? Yes, we do. Yep. we do. It's in the packet. Mm -hmm. oh, it's okay. the last page. Gotcha. It's pretty hard to uh, make a resolution last after raising a share of the uh, wheelage tax when we don't have a resolution on the wheelage tax. Yet, but, have to the tax first. but there'd be the uh, certainly um, pretty combined. Uh, well, how about this? Uh, I, I would I would move that we uh, are you going to put a number to this, Vicky? This do you have a number that would, on this wheelage on the cost sharing one? Would you have a number? So, yeah. 2013. It says 2013 dash. The, the shared one. Or the, other the shared one. one. The shared one. 43. I would move uh, resolution 2013-43, uh, subject to resolution 2013-42 being approved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion is carried. We just needed the one motion, correct? No. No, we got another one. Okay. Kevin? I would yeah. move. I would move that that resolution. The main at least forty-two. Do we have a second? I'll second. Discussion. And again, I I just want to point out that this this allows us to um, do some work, and it's. It's been the intent of the um, Highway Tracking Committee that, that these funds will be used to um, better improve our road systems within the county. And it's desperately needed, and we can't depend on the state to do it. It's a better option than, than uh, property tax. So before, we vote, before we vote on this, I just have one. I understand there are two ways to collect this money, to do it locally or go to the state. It's my understanding, recommendation out of committee and our uh, administrator is the money to go to the state and then come back to us. That's correct. Good. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion's carried. Thank you, Nate. Thanks, guys. Nate, you did a good job. Brian? Thanks. Where's your boss today? Is he He's, uh, he's in Kenora right now in Canada fishing. So everybody deserves a vacation. All right. Cheaper to go down. Brian's yeah. to talk. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to comment on Nathan was out at the county fair uh, for government night last Thursday night. They, did a, they had a very nice display out there. Plus, they also brought in some of their heavy equipment for display, which went over really well. So um, thank them for the extra effort on that. Too. Yeah. One other thing that, that I didn't realize when I was out at the fair, uh, one of our former uh, employees, uh, Joe Gerner, was out there as well. And, and he's now working for uh, 
um, the Helping Hands program, the, the, the Farm Relief program. So uh, it was good to see him putting his, his uh, talents to use for, for their organization. I was pretty proud uh, seeing him step up and volunteer for that. So Certainly. Just an update on, on one of our former employees. Super. Thank you, Nate. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Miss Porter, okay. we are just about on time. Okay. Rhonda Porter, Mary Lumen Olson, Lumen Olson, and Susan Roll or Rowell? How do you say your last name? Roll. Roll. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. And uh, you're going to talk to us about Minnesota Share and County Staffing. Yes. We Welcome. are here for the long awaited discussion about Minsure. Which is, of course, the impetus for our conversation today is a result of some pretty significant legislation, which you've been hearing about since 2010, um, the Affordable Care Act, often called Obamacare, and the new legislation passed in Minnesota called the Minnesota's Health Insurance Marketplace Act. And that legislation passed this year um, is um, where this online marketplace called Minsure has been established in Minnesota as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And that online marketplace will be um, taking, starting with open enrollment in October, October 1st of this year. And so all of this legislation is, of course, the impetus for our conversation with you today. So um, I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about, I'm going to have Mary talk a little bit about um, the legislative changes and the individuals that will now be eligible for Medicaid. So that's the public health or the uh, public health care programs in Minnesota. And that's really what we're talking about because those are the folks that will impact the work that we do here at the local level. Um, let's talk a little bit about those changes and then a little bit about how those um, those new applicants or those transfers will come into the county and the work that that will mean for our staff here. So, Mary, do you want to start with? Well, Rhonda put this out really, really quite well because I don't know too much about this yet. This is still coming down. We're still learning about it. But Minnesota Care, the next generation, will increase um, coverage to an additional. She's got 127,000 people. Minnesotans there. We don't do Minnesota Care in Clay County. We refer those to DHS. The applications that come in first, we determine if they're eligible for health care MA. And then if they're not, we refer them on to Minnesota Care. Some come in just requesting Minnesota Care, and those automatically go just straight to Minnesota Care. So we first look at eligibility for MA. And then if they're not, we will pass them on. Sometimes family members, some family members are eligible for MA and some are not. So we'll have some of those family members in the county. We're servicing them under MA and some are serviced at DHS under Minnesota Care. So that's the expansion for Minnesota Care. The expansion of medical assistance for adults without children, they increased the, the, the um, level to 138% of the FPG. Um, it's funded by medical assistance. That used to be our general assistance medical care program. Those of you who've been here remember that one. Um, these are for adults without children. We're going to see that has already started increasing our caseload on that. The simplified MA eligibility process, streamlining the automated annual reviews. I haven't, I don't know much about this yet. It's still being part of training that we're starting in August. I'll learn more about that. Um, we have a lot of unknowns exactly how we're going to determine eligibility. We're going to be using different eligibility criteria for our families and um, different review cycles that we won't have to do quite so many, I guess. I don't know a lot of this. It's a new system that we will need to learn, new program rules that we will need to learn. The expanded ME for children to the 275% FPG, that, that is the one that raises the income limits for children ages 2 through 18. To one, from 150 to 275 FPG, and the pregnant women with incomes up to 275. Um, so they'll be seeing them on MA instead of Minnesota Care. So we'll get those back. So this is going to increase our workload. We think that throughout Minnesota, 10,000 Minnesota children will be eligible. 
Um, based on the, the legislation, the, the state has made a determination that we're going to see about 1,707 um, citizens in Clay County be eligible for medical. That does not include the applications that we're going to get that we'll have to determine eligibility that will be ineligible. So we're going to see an increase in our intake um, beyond that one, you know, beyond what we do. But right now we probably see about 50 to 50 health care applications. If you add everything, it's about 75 to 80, 90 applications on a weekly basis. So we're busy. We're behind. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, maybe we could just talk a little bit about attachment A because that gives a little more data to what Mary is talking about. And maybe I could just go through with you that attachment. Um, it, it lists the all, all of the 87 counties, and so you'll see if you find Clay County, um, that first number there, 366, what that is saying is that these are new families or children that will be eligible for Medicaid as a result of the eligibility changes for Clay County. Uh, then the 122 is the new Medicaid eligible adults without children, okay? So that total is 488 uh, new individuals that will be eligible <coughs> for Medicaid as a result of eligibility changes. Good. All these children and stuff, aren't they covered under the family policy up to 26 yet? Or are we saying, I'm probably I'm not understanding this whole okay, thing. But. You, that's insurance, <coughs> yes. Okay. Okay. But there's a number <coughs> of people that don't have insurance. Most of our health care families don't have insurance. So these would be low-income families. Families that are getting Medicaid. Mm -hmm. That are eligible for the uh, medical public assistance. health care. Okay. The third category there, the MCRE is Minnesota Care. So these are the families and children that are going to be transferred from Minnesota Care to Clay County. So 1,023. And the next line, the 195, is the Minnesota Care Adults Without Children that will be transferred to the county for management. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by transferring? Well, they're currently on Minnesota Care. So they're, they're going to be taken off of Minnesota Care because now they're going to be eligible for MA, medical assistance. So they're coming back to the county. So we do the administration rather than the state. Right. So we'll have to process those. And, and, and exactly how that transfer is going to occur, I don't know if it's going to be automatic or we will have to actually put all that information into a, that new system. So, so just so I can understand the process a little bit, if, if I understand the first time somebody comes in there, there can be a... A considerable amount of work done because you're, you're building your file on them, you're putting all of these. Uh, one, once that's implemented, uh, then I, I'm assuming there's some checks and balances down the road that make sure they still qualify. Yeah, we have those. to do reviews. Right now we're yeah. doing them every six months. Right, okay. okay now I understand but, that some, but, go ahead. some of the legislation is going to change that so we won't have to do them quite so often. But there's always changes in the household, so if they report a change, we have to look at that change and see if they're still eligible for the program, or do they now meet a spend, have to meet a spend down, which works like an insurance deductible because their income is above the standard. And I, ha I don't really know all the ins and outs of the program yet because I haven't had that information. A lot of things haven't been determined by DHS yet. We're still waiting. I guess I'm just, I'm just trying to, I understand when something like this gets rolled over and even in this case where it's rolled over from from the state to the county yeah and there, there's there's still there's we're still is work that's already been done it seems to me but that this can go from this computer to this computer i don't know if that's going to happen okay. that before in conversions we had yeah we thought it would be automatic no we had to input everything into okay. these systems well, so i don't that's know an this, yeah, question. Not, i don't know what's going to happen there if it's going to be automatic we just have to maintain them or are we going to have to get additional information and actually enter it to a new system? Right. And all, the, all these are trying. Are the, all, all these are, are questions in regards to mm -hmm. you one, have your pages about one staff thing that, meeting, right? Yes. One thing I do know that's going to happen when we get these applications back in the county, they're going to also request other programs. So we're going to have additional applications like for food support or maybe cash assistance. 
Um, that's what normally happens when things come, when they come back to the county. If they're once they're in the county, they'll say, well, let's see if I'm eligible for food support or can I get some cash. So we'll have to take an application and make those determinations. And that would require a new application because it's a different program. So I, I see that so, increasing so, your other so programs. Those, so those, all of those things, these additional things that they would be requesting now, were they getting them someplace before? Probably not. A lot of clients that once they're in Minnesota care, if they're not coming to the county, sometimes they don't bother to come in and request. But once they have to come in, then they'll always check all the other programs. And they may not be eligible for all those programs, but, but really because, because they ask to be assessed for eligibility, sure. it creates that that extra workload. So although the uh, if you tally the Minnesota CARE cases that are transferring, that's the 1,218. Again, these are folks that we're currently not serving that, I mean, they're being served by state staff. Mm -hmm. So they will now come to the county needing county staff. And that's annually? Is that an annual anticipation? Um, right now, well, this, um, no, this would be the total transfer. So it wouldn't be this number every year. Is that what you're asking? Well, once, yeah, once they're yeah. played, but that... They're going to do it in stages. Number four will show right. that they're I doing 25. That. That's just from Minnesota CARE. But during this time, we'll still be taking new applications on, people trying to find out if they can get health insurance or trying to see if they on can get on medical assistance so they don't have to pay for health insurance for 2014. So we'll be, we'll be seeing our intake increase because we're going to get more applications. Right. Um, just going back a little bit, you said this, uh, you used to do a six-month review and now we're not going to do a six-month review? It's my understanding that they're, they're going to stop doing those six-month reviews, might even stretch it out to two years instead of yearly. I'm not 100% sure yet. I'll learn that probably in August. So we wouldn't review these people's cases for No, but the years. thing is, is if they're on another program, if they're on food support or cash, those will still have six-month reviews yearly you know, income reviews and yearly annual reviews, where we, eligibility reviews, where we look at everything. So those programs will still be dealing with those cases on an ongoing basis. And if they report a change, we have to look at that change and see if that change affects their eligibility. I think down the road with the this system, the online uh, market system, as well as some of the new technology, the infrastructure for Medicaid, we eventually will see some efficiencies, we hope, not only just in the, the, um, <clears throat> the system that we use, but also some of the changes in requirements that the staff go through for redetermining that eligibility. Uh, some of that, uh, I think the overall goal and conversation with DHS is that we'll start to see some of those efficiencies. Uh, initially not because we're going to be double entering into two systems. We'll be entering into Maxis and system called Kirum. Uh, so we're going to see up here and then hopefully we'll see some leveling off. Kevin? So, and this, this is quite complicated and excuse me for having a lot of questions. But That's all right. The, I do too. Um, um, the, 1218, these are new ones coming into us, right? But, but they've been processed prior by? For Minnesota Care, which has different eligibility right. rules. Now, now this whole process in this Minsure, this Minsure is kind of the uh, overall hub of, all, of the pool of all sorts of different options. Is that correct? Am correct. I stating that correctly? There's, mm -hmm. So, there, so there's, there, there can be multiple insurance Purchase, purchase uh, different plans available to purchase well, through Minsure, isn't there? It, it's like a, okay, yeah, it's a huff. Okay, right. the, the, all the applications are going to go, this is my understanding, they're going to go to one place, the DHS, it's a big hub, and then they will look at it and determine if they, we need to look at medical assistance, and they ship to the county. Okay, the county will then determine medical assistance. If they're ineligible, then it's shipped to where they can purchase insurance, whether they use their tax refunds, their credits coming from 2015 to purchase their 2014 insurance, whatever, that has, I don't know how that's going to work yet, but that's the idea behind it. 
So is that is that part part of the work that's done that the staff helps them do then? Is that well right now my understanding is in the county we're gonna determine MA eligibility only okay. based on the new criteria that okay. we'll be getting. And for our disabled we're still using the old criteria. So we have two different eligibility criteria that we'll be looking at depending upon where that person fits. So if it's if if they qualify qualify for MA and we maintain that, that ends it. Mm -hmm. If they don't qualify for MA, then they end up back looking in this pool. Well, first we look at Minnesota. They would go to Minnesota Care and see if they get Minnesota Care. If they can't, they're ineligible for that. Then they're going to look at them purchasing through their the, health insurance through this hospital. Through the okay, okay. I'm really trying to That's understand. That's confusing. The, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And the state had estimated that about 450,000 individual consumers will access Minsure about 155,000 small businesses and employees of small businesses, and then 690,000 Medicaid enrollees will going to be accessing this MNSURE system. Um, you had asked a question about um, would the county's role be to help applicants maneuver through this system. One of the pieces to it, there will be a call center that uh, folks can utilize to That's help. statewide. Yes, statewide. Mm -hmm. um, but the state has issued um, requests for proposals, and they are encouraging counties to apply, as well as other entities and communities, churches, um, the CAP agencies, to be what's called in-person assisters that would help individuals maneuver through this system, uh, either over the phone or in person. And there are a set amount of dollars then that these um, in-person assisters can bill, $70, per individual who becomes successfully enrolled through the MNSURE system. Now, we, uh, we haven't submitted an application to do that. I've been talking to Joe Peterson at Lakes and Prairies, and I think Lakes and Prairies as a CAP agency f fits within their role, and I believe that he was going to um, submit an application to do that. There's a lot of concerns around it with the um, the reimbursement not really covering the costs that it would take to have these folks go through the training, be certified, and but. Um, and what the numbers you have here are today's numbers. They're not tomorrow's numbers. These are numbers that came out through DHS, yes. and we but are informed. The, this, this is just what we should plan be for tomorrow. Day after, I mean, they're going to. Yeah, these aren't going yeah, to go down. as we talk. These yeah. aren't going down, correct? No. Thank you. And maybe I could just highlight then the last number on the right. What that is is the 562. Is um, this is DHS's estimate of our currently um, our current caseload of healthcare applicants that we will probably need to touch close to, you know, 562 of those and reassess based on new, the new eligibility. So we're going to have work with new cases as well as our existing caseload. So that's... And, and these numbers do not reflect the, the new applications that we're going to be denying. These are just potential eligibility. I see the, the number of people that we're going to come in through our door is going to be much higher than this. Well, this minster, in it, in it, it's 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 meant for a lot more too than than just those who cannot afford. It's for right? everyone, correct? Um, for example, if I understand the rules correctly, uh, any business entity with less than fifty employees, uh, they don't even have to carry a, a group health plan for them and uh, then but these people would have the option to go through Minsure and to find the, the, the best deal for them to buy Insurance. product on their own, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct? You know, so so the the my point being is we're focusing on on the ones who right and rightfully so that that don't have the coverage at all. But how are those in these small business settings, these employees, what what assistance are they getting to help them un understand this whole new beast that's out there? To uh, what, how, what's, how, what's well, going that's on for them? Part of the sister, the yeah, the, the the phone line, 
um, okay. the call us, center. Yeah. You know, us when they, if they happen to call, we would you know refer them on, okay. help them try to help them through that. Um, but basically, yeah, it's it's and I see people just making a healthcare application just to get started. And they do that. They do. They can do that here. They, can, they can do it, do it online. online. Yeah. They can do it at the state level. Mail. Online, they can right? do it any way they want. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the call center is available to businesses. Right. You know, private, um, and the in-person assisters. My understanding is that is for anyone as well. It is not just for individuals that would likely qualify for the public um, Medicaid programs. So. So those are our numbers. Those are the numbers we've been operating off of. And as Mary said, looking at that 1,700, we feel is a is a low estimate of what our activity level really will be, um, at least initially into the first year of this unfolding. But it is the numbers given to us from DHS. Uh, the next page talks a little bit about the implementation timeline, and so. Basically, what we did there is we took those 1,700 new uh, folks and carried that percentage all the way through to get an estimate of how many we might be seeing starting in January, July, and so forth. Okay, and and this we're not consider we're just considering those 1,700. We're not considering the cases that are going to require adjustment, and those kinds of. Things. Um, so just doing a little bit of comparison, looking at our in Roman number five there, um, based on our February 2013 numbers, we had 8,614 persons enrolled in Medicaid, and adding those 1,700, we'll be at uh, over 10,000, representing 19.82% growth just in that Medicaid program. And we're currently at 8,773. The end of June. Does everybody who ha who is on Medicaid have to go through the county? If they live in Clay County. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the the February numbers we got from DHS, um, they looked at in a snapshot in February. They looked at you know how many people we have on Medicaid, and then how many people we had on Minnesota Care, and it represented 16, little over 16 percent of our population. But think of Clay County, and think how many people out in Clay County don't have health insurance. Quite a few. Yeah. And those are the ones that are, they're going to have to be looking for health insurance for January 1, 2014. Right. Um, okay, so uh, funding. Uh, and I did provide to you in your packet uh, information that came out of DHS relative to the funding and how that's going to change. Um, you've often heard us talk about many of the staff and expenses in our income maintenance unit being eligible for that 50% federal financial participation. One of the things that's going to change is that relative to health care and the administration of health care, that um, match or that participation will change to 75%, which of course is a good thing as we try to um, have to beef up staff in order to uh, assist citizens in getting on Medicaid. So they'll be looking at a 25% county uh, split, 75% federal financial participation. Um, and the one of the things that we had initially heard was that um, there, that 75% match was going to expire, but now. Um, they indicate that that match will stay as long as the state's eligibility system is operating su successfully. So what does that mean? What I take that to mean, as long as our online marketplace is compliant with the Affordable Care Act and that that 75% match would continue. Um, the other positive piece to this is that um, what's been clear is that currently the Medicaid cases that we are managing, that 50% will go to 75% as well. So that will be um, an additional additional revenue to what we're currently doing, even if we didn't add. That's 114 million. Yes, yes, yeah. So that, that was good news as well. Um, so 
in looking at our numbers and looking at kind of talking with DHS, looking at what other counties are doing, I also did attach uh, AMC survey uh, is not complete and I know there's been changes, counties are in the fury of gearing up for this, but for your information, just to get a sense of what other counties were looking at, what their new enrollment was, uh, if they're looking at uh, resource expansion at their human service agencies, what they're looking at and where the board activity was. Just as a reference to get a sense. And as I look at this, I feel that our request and how we're looking at this is consistent with what's happening around the state. So we've, we've uh, thought about a few ideas. We feel that based on the number, and again, we were just using that 1,700, um, that five, an additional five FTE employees would be needed to, um, to get through the implementation, the dual entry, um, the, the initial uh, phases of this. Um, and we looked at simply adding staff or incorporating a proposal that actually has been in conversation probably for about a year and a half, which is uh, looking at one of our programs that we administer, which is the child care program. And there's three programs within that. Um, contracting that with lakes and prairies. Currently, this conversation again started about a year and a half ago as we were talking about uh, human service re redesign and regional efforts. Uh, lakes and prairies came and met with our region four directors and talked about um, administering those child care programs on behalf of our region's counties. So far, Ottertail, Pope, Wadena have contracted and are currently contracting with Lakes and Prairies to administer their programs. Becker County, my understanding, last Tuesday um, have approved for Becker County to do that as well as a part of dealing with the Medicaid expansion. And so we've included that as a part of our plan as well. Of course, Clay County, we're the biggest uh, county in our group and um, represent the largest numbers to that arrangement. But there are a lot of uh, <coughs> pros to entering into that kind of an arrangement. The staff, uh, we've probably, I didn't bring that, but how many programs our income maintenance staff um, are responsible to sift out, and it's a number, 20-some programs when we think of Medicaid, MFIP, DWP, food support, emergency MSA, assistance. emergency assistance. GRH, um, G. It's incredibly overloaded, and uh, they do a great job, but the volume is crazy, and the, the information that you have to know in terms of all of those programs so we think there's a lot of benefits to carving out this particular program and contracting with Lakes and Prairies. And, and we are struggling. Yeah. Lakes and Prairies uh, does have the ability and staff to do this. Yeah, they would gear up and um, as more counties come on board, we, we hopefully like to see this as a whole regional mm -hmm. effort, but they will have to gear up for staffing. So that if, if we approved this as a part of our plan, the start date for that, we'd have to work with Lakes and Prairies because I know Becker County just approved as well. So um, again, Lakes and Prairies has re um, Clay County resource and referral. So they already are working with our licensed providers in our community. So this is taking the child care assistance applicants. So th this is families um, that are low income that get assistance to pay for their child care. So it's a really nice link between the applicants of child care and our licensed providers. Okay. Um, so we could, we could go through and in, in looking at the first grid at the bottom there outlines um, the cost for, uh, if we looked at adding the five staff that, that we felt necessary, we looked at four financial workers and one office support specialist. The cost of that, this would be step one new employees. And what that 75% federal financial participation would be in terms of revenue. And then the enhanced revenue from our current caseload, which is the 50% to the 75%. 
and then what the total cost and the total expenditures would be. Now, as we went through this, and it ended up to be um, that we actually would have a gain in some revenue, I was, is this right? And Susan and I looked at our numbers and <laughs> went back. Yeah, it's because of the 50. It is because of that, correct, yes. Now, some things that aren't necessarily considered in here is, and I have that over on the additional considerations, is that, of course, with five staff, we will have to, there's some equipment needs, and that's going to be the scenario in, in each case. But um, the second uh, idea there is looking at, right now, uh, three staff, which would be two financial workers, one office support specialist, uh, the contract with Lakes and Prairies, again adding in the revenue, and then the, the new part to this would be um, we've estimated about two FTE employees are currently involved in administering the child care programs, and so if and, and they do not receive the 50%. Uh, federal financial participation on that activity. So we, w we anticipate seeing some increased revenue as a result of moving that program off of their plates and allowing them more time to work in health care. Rhonda, the dollar amount that you have there for um, what would be the contract with Lakes and Prairies? Yes. 137, I see there's no, would, would Lakes and Prairies receive the revenue for that then? So this is a, uh, a little complicated. We, um, we receive dollars for administering the child care programs right now. We receive about um, 80,000, 80, let's say, about 80,000. Um, 73,7. So that revenue would continue, and it would continue to come into our budget because it's earned based on how many dollars go out the door for child care assistance. So it'll still come into our budget, and we will, in a sense, use that to pay lakes and prairies. But in doing that, it still creates that $73,000 hole in revenue in our budget. So it ends up, the net impact ends up being the same. I see. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because you were planning to use that revenue for yeah, something else. Yeah, you know, it would be nice if if we were going to contract out, send them the money, but yet so then we could reduce staff. By contracting, we're losing that seventy-five percent. Well, we don't get seventy-five percent in administering the child care program. That's separate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're not losing okay. it that way, no. But if we if we kept. And this other option, we're keeping everything for ourselves, right? We're doing yeah. everything in house here. Yeah, and the other option, we're keeping the child care programs. We don't get 75% on that administration, yeah. but. Yeah. Are we uh, quite sure that uh, Lakes and Prairies can, can do it for that contracted price? I mean, is that. The, where's their efficiency come? Just in numbers and. Working. Right, and I think as they build their numbers, they will gain efficiencies and economies of scale as well. One of the things that is, of course, a, a benefit to us here in Clay County is that Lakes and Prairies is right here and right here in our building. Whereas with Ottertail, Wadena, Pope, and even Becker, they're going to be doing some um, reaching out in those communities, but it's really great that they're right in our building. So uh, some of our applicants that come to our door, we can just send them down the hallway, which is really um, a nice piece to have. Um, Under these two scenarios, uh, uh, scenario, the first scenario where you're asking for the four, or would suggest the four financial workers, then all the, um, Oops, excuse me, that all the child care stuff would, would s still stay in its current format. We'd still be doing it the way that we're doing it, right? That would, so nothing mm -hmm. would change. Um, you know, so to me it looks, it, it looks to me like there's, there's a difference of 80 some thousand dollars by uh, the two proposals there. And I, I would question why, uh, why we'd want to do that. 
Well, when we looked at this, we went through that same process of thinking, you know, well, is this a no-brainer? Why would you want to do that? Um, I mean, I think there are a couple things we haven't considered in this. Um, first, I will say that um, I do think that the contract with Lakes and Prairies, I think we're going to realize some budget savings that maybe isn't really reflected here. Because one of the things is um, right now our auditor staff also spend about 0.5 FTE time uh, managing our providers, all of our um, child care assistance providers, and processing all of the vouchers for child care assistance. So they process about, I think we figured, 600 and some vouchers a month on average, Susan. I just took those three months of average. And we have um, 193 licensed child care providers and 42 legally non-licensed child care providers that we manage. Now, these would all go to Lakes and Prairies to deal with, as well as all of the processing of the payments. We think with health care, the, the impacts of health care is not going to be contained to our income maintenance unit. We are going to feel it in our social service area, we are going to feel it in our child support area, and we're going to feel it in our, the auditor side as well because of more folks on Medicaid means more MA access, means more payments, means, you know. And so in, in looking at this contract with Lakes and Prairies, we feel that it is going to allow us some additional staff time in other areas to deal with the impacts of health care. So therefore not having to add staff there, here. So I mean, it, it was hard to kind of put all that down and figure out how that will all wash out, but I think to, I, I think it's pretty clear we're going to see the impacts across the board. Okay, John, uh, are we then moving, if we did this contract, and we're moving some of our child care people into the financial worker? Is that what we're doing? I mean, why? I guess I'm still not understanding why we only need two financial workers under this scenario. You got the same caseload either way on, on that. Oh, we wouldn't and, have that program to deal with. Well, the child care program we wouldn't have. Yeah. So we'd be moving about 328 families off of the caseload to Lakes and Prairies. But some of those families are on medical assistance, some are on food support, so we're still dealing with some of those families, yeah. a lot of those families. I, yeah, I'm torn. I don't, you know, it's, if you ask some of the workers who feel getting rid of that program is worth it, you know, just getting two workers, getting rid of the program, some would say give, me, give us four workers, you know, it's, I'm torn. But, you well, know, it's one less program that workers would have to learn, one less system. It's another system they have to learn because it's separate from Max. Um, so that would be a benefit. I think the other piece is that, um, you know, space. And the other piece that is on my mind as well is as this unfolds and three to five years down the road when we see how all this is institutionalized, will we have um, efficiencies that uh, will not, we won't necessarily need all these staff. So with a contract to Lakes and Prairies, we're starting out, you know, bringing on full-time permanent staff at a smaller scale at this point, um, and that will, so. Are we looking at adding this staff right away? Because the 1700, according to this, they're not all going to be on here until but January 16th. Open enrollment starts October 1st and trainings August and September. So we'd have to get that staff on to get them trained. There is enhanced funding for training, but only for Healthcare. that time frame. But we wouldn't have the caseload till. But we'll have new applications. This is just your Minnesota care cases coming back to the county. So your new applications will be coming in. They could be they'll be starting any time. Um, but we'll have to start looking October one under that new system and determine eligibility for those people. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to get our HR person up here. I got a couple questions for Darren if, if he could join us at, at this. Uh. Hey, Darren. 
That's quite right, but that's why you get paid the big money. I guess so. <laughs> um, in, in the scenario here, in part of what, what troubles me, and I think uh, Frank is alluding to it a little bit, and, and you mentioned yourself, Mary, there's, there's so many unanswered questions here. There's so many unknowns that we're dealing with here. And I don't want to overburden the staff with all these new things coming in either. But to make a permanent commitment to this until we know how it shakes out, do we have the ability to bring these people in for a specified time period while this new enrollment process is going through to determine ultimately how many of them might continue to be needed and then maybe some of them may not be able to be needed. We, we've heard how many times today have we heard there's so many unknowns here, we don't know. So I would find it disappointing to hire five new people to tell them nine months down the road, a year down the road, that you know what, we just don't quite, we didn't quite need what we thought, we have to let you go. No, um, I see what you're saying, but right now we're struggling and we've been behind. And I think, I don't think, I don't think we're not gonna need them. Um, we're gonna see an increase in, in our, our cases. We're gonna see an increase in people. Um, as the economy, the way it is, we've been just gradually, we've been going up and up and up I don't see that stopping. I'm going to have retirements. I know I'm having one next year and maybe another one at the end of the year or the beginning well, of the year. But those year. can be replaced. Well, yes, but the problem is, is training and getting people. Because I've had eight experienced staff gone since 2010, we've been struggling since 2010 trying yeah. to keep up. And these numbers are not going to go down. No, I don't see them going down. Well, we haven't, we haven't been full staffed in that unit for well, well over two but, years. The numbers may not go down, but after the initial, the additional work that goes into it, the amount of work to maintain them after that isn't as much as the original work that goes into it. But I think what the state is telling us about all these new changes and how it's going to be easy, I think it's kind of deceiving because we just got notification now because the feds want us to make sure that we're doing things that not overriding eligibility and we have to do additional steps on, on case noting why we fiat it's something that overrides the automated system which we have to do a lot so this is going to add additional work to our workers to do it properly we haven't been able to do it properly for a while because we've been so short staffed i you know if 34 years I've been in this unit mm -hmm. and nothing ever turns out the way the state's going to be. We were supposed to be paperless with Maxis. That didn't happen. Right. You know, I it's don't see hour. this being that just so efficient that we're going to lose staff. I just don't see that happening. Well, I'm not talking about losing staff. Even I'm talking, I'm I'm talking the about four. the amount of staff that you're four, adding. Four, I see we're going to need them. Yeah. I guess, so, so, I guess so, my, my opinion would be that if you add them now so that they then get I don't know if you can say caught up before all of this kicks in. And then through probably normal attrition, having if we find out that we don't need all of these five in this position, then through attrition of other positions in the financial world or in the social services department, we can start filling some holes and, you know, take those if we don't need five then we and we only need three, then we through attrition we find another job for those other two. I mean that's a possibility but um, that would only be if the if the um, workload you know wasn't what we expected which doesn't sound to be the case with them um, no, we just don't know John, uh, if we went ahead and contracted for the child care portion um, I suppose it's very hard then to come back if, if we decide that didn't work a year from now to come back and and uh, start over <laughs> Or take it back again. Uh, how does how do you see that? Is a is that a, if we make that decision? Is that is that more a permanent thing than the added extra employees? Uh, well, not necessarily. It would be a contract with them, and there would be terms of termination of the contract. Um, I I do think even separate from health care, this is something that's been on our radar, and I probably would have 
prepared a presentation to you to look at that irregardless of health care because I think there's so many pieces of it that make sense that we do that in the long run. Um, so, yeah, it could be a little more complicated, but it, again, it's a contract and uh, it wouldn't be insurmountable to take it back at some point that if that made sense. What's your recommendation to this board as our director? Well, um, I oh. feel... No. What is your recommendation? My recommendation would be that we look at the option with the contracting with Lakes and Prairies. Thank you. Gentlemen, what do you think? And you, you feel that, I mean, that, like Kevin pointed out, that's $80,000 difference uh, that you feel that, that that could shake out so that it would be less than that. Uh, I feel it would be less than that. I think we were really, we were pretty conservative, and Susan would agree with all of our analysis that we were conservative on the revenues that we will see. I also think that we will see added benefits to that contract that wasn't necessarily able to articulate down on paper. Um, when I first looked at this as well, I went through quite a bit of processing in my own mind what might make sense. Um, and, you know, you can look at it either way. And as Mary said, um, she probably would have a unit divided about what would make, what they would feel would be the best option. Um, I do think that um, marrying the child care assistance program with what Lakes and Prairie's Resource and Referral is already doing does make a lot of sense uh, from our client standpoint, from an administration standpoint. So I, I, I am leading to that. Thank you. John? I'd like to ask Mary then, these two financial worker additions, if we, if we lose the, you know, if we do the contract, is that going to help you to get caught up as well? Uh, um, it will help us, you know, we won't get caught up by January 1 because they'll have to go through training. They won't be trained in time to really be productive for, you know, getting us caught up with other programming. Um, but it would help us with them getting tr them trained and being able to take on the health care and probably work on those applications where other workers can work on them that yeah. way. Kevin? The, um, under this contract, so you're saying too that all the administrative work for our daycare providers would also shift to Prairie? Uh, have, have, have they had any input into this? Uh, well, these would not be... The uh, licensing of daycare providers? Is no, it? that doesn't that's change. The, that doesn't no, change. that still okay. stays with us. Okay. Um, this would be licensed providers that take a child care assistance recipient. I see. Okay. Yep. And you've been discussing this with Lakes and Prairies for some time. We have. Yeah. And part of the reason for myself not bringing it earlier, a year ago, was that even at that time, the numbers just quite weren't quite working out for me, and I, I didn't feel I could come to you and say, well, we could reduce a staff person and do this contract because we were so overloaded with our workload. Okay. Frank? Where does Lakes and Prairies get their funding from? Are we going to have to get more funding than them? Or where do they get their funding from? Well, Lakes and Prairies is a community action agency, and they yeah. get their funding from a variety of resources as well, but they receive federal funds as well as state funds, to admit, and they, they administer a variety of... I mean, uh, they'd have to add programs. staff if we're going to go with them. Correct. Correct. I mean, they, I don't know. I'm not... not, well, not with, with the budget enough mm -hmm. yet here, that uh, do we contribute to Lakes and Prairies then? Oh. Mm -hmm. So they would come, probably come back and say we need some more money. <laughs> well, we don't... We don't give any, uh, other than for the senior program, we don't give any direct money to Lakes and like, Prairies. We rent them space and we... Well, we do have a contract contracts. with them for contract. supervised visitations, oh, yes. yeah. as well as um, we do contract with them for our financial literacy program. So some of the families coming in to apply for emergency assistance, we will refer to them for financial literacy. <laughs> but that is paid for through... Um, State and federal. That's funds. different from a your donation to the. It is contract. We're not right. giving any direct. No. No, we don't. No, them. no, no we don't. Yeah. Correct. It's for services. The, That's correct. Kevin, the um, 
the um, work that would be turned over to Lakes and Prairies under your proposal, what is, what is, the, what is the process of our citizens who would use that if they are dissatisfied with that service? It would be the same as if they're dissatisfied with our service. They have the right to appeal and have a hearing with okay. DHS. Okay. And then they, the judge would make a determination if they follow the rules or not. What are your wishes, gentlemen? I think Ron is looking for a motion of support for um, the option regarding lakes and prairies. So I, I, I personally like the, the idea of the contract. I mean, I think that I, I wish the numbers showed a little bit closer here, but uh, I mean, I think there's a chance for efficiency. The more contract counties they, they connect with, uh, the better I think that, that system could work. One thing I'd like to mention with, with late one agency doing the BSF, the basic sliding fee child care, see, the, each, each county gets an allotment. And you have to stay within your allotment. And some counties have extra money, and some counties have waiting lists. If, if, if they get where they're running a number of counties, I think they could do a better job of making sure that all that BSF money is used for that need, that child care. I'm sure if they, if they approach the state that they could get, you know, we're just doing all the counties, as long as all the counties agree, and I don't see why we wouldn't, because we'd want the money to be used instead of sent back. So be a better management of that allocation. I I would move that we uh, go along with our director's uh, recommendation to to go into the would be the second scenario that's shown here. Then is there a second? I'll second oh. the motion. Discussion. Well, I, I'm. I, I'm going to oppose it. I, I don't understand how we can justify uh, at this point, you know, an additional eighty thousand dollars in cost when uh, this this original one would work as well. So I, I I haven't seen enough differences as to further discussion. Vicky, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Chair. Yes. If I may, I, I, uh, I haven't commented on this, but we did spend about an hour and a half one day on this, and I know Rhonda was torn about that, and she didn't have a recommendation. And I'll tell you what, this budget's not going to look good, and this is an $80,000 swing, so I just want you to consider that uh, before you make a permanent decision on this. So something to, to figure. We've got to pay for this somehow. Vote yes. Campbell? No. No. Gross. No. Yes. Motion fails. Do we have uh, another motion? Well, I mean, uh, we only have one option left. <laughs> okay, well, we've got to go through the process. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and again, I, I, um, I'm a little leery of, of, uh, of bringing on five new people here when, when there's so many things unanswered. But Darren, I, I think you uh, gave a really good option provided what may come. And Mary, I, I, don't, I just don't know the answers as to uh, what work might go. But I, I, would, uh, I would move that we move forward with um, the first scenario presented um, with the four financial workers enough. And this is all due to the change in the Health Care Reform Act with the understanding that the revenues uh, would still be s sufficient enough to really cover the cost of those new hires. Do we have a second? Second. Discussion. Vicki, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Campbell. Yes. Wayland. Yes. Gross. Yes. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, thank ladies. You. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know there's gonna, you're going to have a lot of hard work on this. <laughs> You know, and I think, you know, in this whole deal, we're going to be pulling our hair out as counties, and businesses are, too. I just want you to know that. They're trying to understand this whole thing. We're in recess, and we're right on schedule.
call the meeting back to order at this time, and our administrator, Brian Berg, and County Treasurer Lori Johnson will spend a few minutes discussing the budget planning update. Put Lori on the hot speed seat here, yeah. too. So. That's why I said here. <laughs> <laughs> you need Lori's to be in the nice camera. To have the first lady on the table. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and other commissioners. Um, we would have liked to have brought your packet along with you today that, you know, it's 70 some page printout, but. Um, we just feel that there, we, we need to do some analysis before we get to that. Um, when the, the agencies have supplied us with their budgets and Lori has compiled them and there, we just, we'll, you'll see there's some questions as we go through this and, and we will get all of the um, goals and things put together hopefully this week and we'll get a printout uh, for next meeting and then hopefully at the conclusion of this meeting you can decide uh, as to what departments you want to see, if you want to see them all, you want to see the ones with new requests and things along those lines because we need to move down the road. But um, we want to go over some things today with you and then um, get some direction from you as to where you want to go with your budget. But all departments and agencies have returned their 20 or 2014 budget worksheets. Lori has compiled the information and we are in the process of assuring uh, accurate information prior to bringing the spreadsheets to the county board following are several items of information uh, and concern. We have approximately $447,000 in new requests. Um, they include a uh, FTE at, at motor vehicle, uh, information services, uh, the, uh, that's Mark Shop is asking for $50,000 worth of, of new software and, and Tim is asking for uh, $20,000 in in uh, the internal service fund addition. Uh, Veteran Services is asking for some additional hours uh, for a part-time employee uh, for coverage. Um, corrections, uh, that's a real challenging one because you're well aware that DOC reduced uh, six more beds effective 2014. All of those People are occupying space over in the county jail right now, and that's, so that's six beds that's going to go uh, out of county next year. Uh, and I think the cheapest rate we have right now is $55 a day. And then there's medical costs that, uh, there will be medical costs anyway, but, but uh, and then she's added one person in there for transportation issues in regards to additional employees. And I wasn't going to talk numbers today, but but uh, that's around $213,000 in new requests from hers. Then uh, just her regular budget has in, is sowing a, suggestion, a uh, suggested increase of like $160,000 because of medical costs of, of current uh, um, prisoners and different things too. So that, that's going to be sizable. Uh, extension is asking for a half-time position and uh, I know this has gone before the the uh, extension committee, but um, they're they're asking for the replacement of the one that was taken away four years ago or whatever. Right. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. They're but, just put back. Yeah. yeah. But as as we've instructed the the departments is that what was taken away. I understand. They're gone. Yeah. These are new requests now when they come back for filling positions. And building and grounds. You're talking about? And building and grounds is uh, is asking for uh, another full time. Mm -hmm. uh, maintenance or for janitorial service, uh, they uh, they get concerns all the time about staff and cleaning and things, especially over in the family service building. Uh, social services, um, if I could have written the memo right now, we would have had numbers to put in there. But uh, this was after your discussion this morning as to what direction you went. So. Uh, so is that what was in regards to was this issue? Yes, it was. <clears throat> you know, and, and really, Brian, and, and from my standpoint, the reason I supported that is it was it was neutral. cost neutral. That's right. And had it not been cost neutral, as a matter of fact, it was cost savings. Really, when that's you look right. at it, that's exactly right. Had we done that, I, I would have made the same objections that I made in the past that they should have gone through this exact process of the budget to do. Yep. It. Yep. Yep. 
So, 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 so this item has been resolved. This been item resolved. Okay. Yep. That's a good a good thing that we can get one of these off. <laughs> and we made money. We actually, have a, pro a plus. Sir. Yes, there but should be. That wouldn't be in the 447 anyway because it was an unknown, right? Uh, no, she. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. What she had put in there was sixty thousand dollar increase within the four forty seven. So that's because we it was take a net that effect. Out so that will come out, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's an adjustment we can make, and, and uh, before it comes to you, and juvenile detention uh, had listed uh, the is looking at some changes, and um, had not included in the new request. So right. he had listed in the regular budget. Um, corrections. What were the those two numbers, what's the total of those two numbers? It was around $400,000. That's 90% of the... That's not the new request. It was about 213000 was new request for corrections. So, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's the six beds. That's the six beds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Okay. And that's... We have no choice. Uh, no. Okay. It's going to be... Moving right along. Other items of concern in the regular budgets, I mentioned corrections already included that in, in the other comment. The sheriff's office, the uh, school resource officer, that will be somewhat offset by uh, school revenues. Um, is either $31,000 or $34,000? $31,000. 31, um, and we just determined that yesterday, so those now we're plugging those figures in. So there was some, there was some work this week, the follow-up questions, and as you can tell, we, uh, we've talked about these. Uh, probation. Uh, this was, I talked with Shelley yesterday on it, and this was a, a huge loss. They have lost a grant funding that they could not put in here. But she assured me yesterday that they have applied for an OJP grant, the Office of Justice Programs grant. It's a $300,000 grant for a two-year grant. If, that, if she is successful with that, that will really help the budgeting process. That would be approximately $150,000 worth of revenue, and hopefully by next week we will decide whether that should be put in there or not. Because uh, if they are granted positions, I know this board has been um, real um, concerned about granted positions being then picked up by the county. And frankly, the way the budget is written right now, uh, they're being picked up by the county and rather than being granted positions. And, and uh, we'll have to have quite a bit of discussion about that, I'm sure. Uh, several outside agencies are requesting increases. Uh, many of you serve on these uh, these committees, so you know what's coming in. Lake Agassiz Library is looking at a at an increase. Uh, Clay County Historical Society. And we'll have these all these listed out uh, when we bring the figures to you, but we want those as accurate as possible when we bring them in. Um, and so they've been talked about. Uh, sequestration. Uh, Commissioner Whalen mentioned that word this morning. That's affecting a lot of these. The senior coordinator position, uh, just as an example, is asking for $9,000 increase. That's about a $30,000 increase on, on the, or I'm sorry, a 30% increase. Uh, right now your contribution is about $30,000 or a little over to that senior coordinator position. Um, and uh, because of sequestration and federal funding on it uh, through some of the other departments, uh, uh, he's coming to us to ask for more in regards to that. Um, there's been quite a bit of talk about the surveyor's budget going back to $50,000 from the $40,000, whether you'll want to do that or not. Uh, another issue, and, and this, this is mentioned for, for you to put some thought into it as it progresses forward, but in 2013, there was $450,000 in reserves from the social service budget and 250000 from public health uh, from reserves were, were utilized or were obligated. And if you remember, we did not necessarily cut their spending amount. We uh, suggested that that be funded through reserves if needed. I have spoken to Rhonda and she said they're running about pretty even this year. And I know you're, you're going to be waiting for that six month report to see where the finances are and we need to get that into you too. But that just ended June 30th. But if she's utilizing the 450000 this year that we took from the reserves to supplement that, um, that means that will have to be made up in your request or you will have to reduce the funding in order to make up that gap. And it's a sizable gap when you put any increase on that, that may be needed for 2014 just on regular programs, plus you add the 450. Um, 
that's a, a big gap there in 250 in public health. Um, so there's some ground we need to make up there. Um, just some other things. We are currently projecting an MCIT dividend. Last year was sizable. We've been reassured that with cutting the premiums and the investment dollars down, that the dividends aren't going to be as high. So I think Lori has hopefully conservatively um, is going to put in $150,000 in there. When does that number come up? Uh, it's pretty soon. Yeah. It's August, you by, it, yeah, by the end of August. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Employee health insurance, I think you heard from, from uh, Human Resources this morning that we'll have that on, in August as well. We're projecting just uh, using the figure of 200000 right now. Last year it was a $300,000 increase. So let's hope it stays under 11% considerably. I think that's what it was last year. Uh, we'll be including the 2% cost of living adjustment, and that's $446,000 in the, in the budget. Um, county program aid, we have not received an official uh, amount on that yet, but um, what we've received from AMC and, and the projections when the legislature was on, that that would be very close to the $500,000. So that's a real plus. And Lori has estimated, I asked her a while ago to, if she could give us an estimate on the sales tax, which may be saved. And um, that's, she figured, five to $600,000. Um, hasn't really figured out how to distribute that yet. Well, it's, you know, the biggest portion of that would be in the internal service fund in the big chunks. But it's, you know, office supplies all the way down the line, so it's pretty hard to did little bits and pieces all over. Did that start in 1st of July? No, no. January 1st. 2014. That has not been included in there, though. That'll help out our numbers if we can arrive at some kind of a, unless we just use a figure just like we do with the, with the cost of living increase in the health insurance and just put a number in there. Uh, the state legislature, and you guys are all aware of this, the state legislature has imposed levy limits. Um, we are checking on eligible exemptions. I know in other years they have exempted debt payments uh, they have exempted uh, law enforcement, you know, such as the jails, with with uh, the squeeze that we're being put there. And I don't know if you got an answer on that yet. Well, today I filled out. There's a form that we have to send in to the Department of Revenue with our 2013 and 2012 levies. Well, the only thing they asked for was bond payments. I mean, they asked for a number of other things, but we don't have any of those. So the only thing we had of the list was bond payments. Mm, that might be a signal that yeah, so. they're not exempting law enforcement functions as they have other times that they have. How long does that take, Lori, for them to hear back? I think we find out the middle of August. Okay, we certainly have to yeah. have that time to, we have a month after that. To right. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's about the middle of August. Okay. But um, I think we've seen as the economy has improved. Um, demand on services have improved. Now, I'll just go back and, and say that, you know, Motor Vehicle is asking for an FTE. We haven't included all of the revenue increases either in this, and I know they're expected to be up about $70,000 in revenue. That's going to help. But that, um, I have included that. That you've included that in the budget already, yeah. And, and uh, but those are some of the scenarios that you will have to evaluate. I know um, as if things stand the way they are, the assessor's office uh, fees will increase about $29,000 for 2014. Um, things like that, there's, there's some additional fees and things that help out. Um, so I guess we're to the point where uh, we can certainly have discussions on any of those issues, but um, what would you like to start out with the departments coming before you that are asking for new requests? We can start setting those up because we'll have the documents to you uh, next week. And uh, I got a couple. Of, uh, I didn't see anything on there. In soil water conservation district. Did you get their request? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I didn't see anything because I think their request is for around twenty-five thousand. In addition. additional funds. Yeah, I think they're, um, uh, Mr. Chair. I think their revenues or the grantings were. Uh, well, that's up too, but yeah. their, I think their request was up. A little bit. A little yeah. Bit from last mm -hmm. year. yeah. Yeah. And you also mentioned sequestration. 
Why should that cost us more? I thought we were supposed to save money on that stuff. On sequestration? Oh, no, we're not going to save any money because what the federal the government, government does is, is they have cut payments and cut some things to some of these federal entities that, that oh. receive grants. And the senior uh, coordinators program gets money from some of the other entities, and, and uh, Commissioner Whalen mentioned it this morning, and they get monies from here and there, federal dollars. Well, those have dropped you know, 20% or something along those lines. So uh, if the service, if you want to offer the service, then it falls back on the local taxpayer, and it's the same with the state and the, and the federal government. So, Grant? Well, it's, it's difficult until we know what the MCIT, you know, money yeah. is going to be in and uh, what our county program aid is going to be. It's really tough to, you know, I mean, to make any hard decisions, but yeah. I think probably the sooner we start hearing from the, uh, the county uh, departments, probably the better. Uh, how about, uh, have you looked at, how does the reserves look for social services this year and, and uh, public health? I mean, that's been helping us the last couple of budget cycles. Yeah. So are they looking in pretty good shape again? Are we gonna see a substantial increase in that reserve? No, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, uh, in talking with Rhonda, she said her costs are really up, auto home placements and things are up. So she's, she feels she's going to be pretty close to where she budgeted last year, including the $450,000 from the reserves. That's what scares her a little bit. It would really be nice if she was saying, yeah, we're going to be about flat without taking the 450 from reserves. So, oh, but we're halfway through the year, so we'll have a good estimate on that very soon, too. Uh, Laurie said she can run those figures now for the first six months. And, uh, yeah. And I'll caution you on that too, I guess, and we always, and you're well aware of it, but many times there's payments that come out at the beginning of the year that will show maybe a, a larger use. And then there's always bills that are outstanding that do get reconciled by the end of the year because she goes into 2014 quite a ways and applies it to the budget. So it is kind of a ballpark figure, and, and you know that. So, John? I think they, I mean, we have to remember that uh, we knew this with social service and uh, and public health that if their if their costs went up that we would be you know having to you know to pay that out of the reserves because we uh, they had revenues over expenditures considerably for a couple of years and we yep. decided that maybe maybe they were you know under uh, projecting their income that's what it's there for, for yeah. three years in yeah. a row I mean, we were yeah. supposed to so when I think that we we shouldn't be surprised that if the costs go up that we have to use some of that that money that's uh, right. And I think uh, you're absolutely right. But what the problem that happens is when we fill a gap with reserve, then we've got to, if, if we want to stay flat, mm -hmm. we'll have to make up those reserves sometime down the road. Right. You know. right. But it, yeah. It's unfortunate that we have levy, levy limits for 2014 because they're using 2013 as a base. So that means, yeah. and if levy limits were to continue, that means that 450 is being cut every single year not just a one time. Yeah. So it's a, the timing was a bit unfortunate on that. So. Well, some of the requests, uh, you know, some of the outside agency requests, uh, you know, we hadn't increased them for, what, four years or something? Yep. And, and so, I mean, I think it was, uh, for instance, the historical society certainly will get by without the requested increase. But uh, since they hadn't received one for a number of years, it was, uh, uh, I mean, that's why they asked for, for one. But uh, it would be more difficult for things like the senior coordinator position since that one's a direct cut from uh, funding that they currently have had. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be in, in, in a tougher tougher position than than some of the others, I think. But, John? Well, I, in answer to your question, Brian, I, you know, I, think, I think I'd like to hear back from Lori and maybe your department head over to Motor Vehicle Department, too. And uh, I the demands that are going on there are significant mm -hmm. uh, just with the uh, amount of traffic that you're dealing with there if, if there was a place that's really overloaded right now with customers that's one of them so I'm, I'm interested in that I think we got to try to you know that's our taxpayers going in there and they're spending an awful long time waiting in line and mm -hmm. they're frustrated and uh, we need to try to improve that service so I, I'm anxious to and and I think what will help in that decision Laurie would be 
how we can show that your the increased traffic what's that's raised in, in revenue I think we need that here and on the record to help okay. support that because I, I think that's an area of, of real concern we haven't even talked yet about um, uh, how, how we're gonna how we would fund the whole uh, potential remodeling that's we want to see done over there so that's another issue that's some of that's going to come out of 2014 money I would think we got to find it someplace um, in terms of who else to see, um, you know, I wouldn't mind talking to Robbie to see um, on the building and grounds, you know, could they could they get by with something less or uh, how, how serious is that? The juvenile detention, I think we're going to have a discussion with, with uh, him today and, and uh, that, that becomes more than just this board, it's, it's how we're going to keep all of our member counties satisfied too and, and uh, making sure that that stays within reason so um, but we'll start with that today with with him this is the first I'm hearing about the veteran service thing and maybe maybe grant can provide us with information on on what would be well, needed I think there in the same mode as more vehicle you know there's a, just a, a ever increasing number of clients that they're dealing with because of you know, all the, the veterans being discharged now, so their numbers are just, you know, continuing to go up. And they've got more and more people wanting services, and they're trying to keep up, so. And I, and I really think it's important for us to talk to Julie again. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot we can do about that 213, but I'd really like to understand, because we currently have uh, staff that's that's transporting and does it require one more full-time people because we have six more people to transport I, I don't know if that's that doesn't quite compute to me mm -hmm. you know so I think we should we should hear from Julie on that one um, and I think the other ones are You know, I, I think the key is going to be what these lemmy limits do and, and what this sheet ends up uh, bringing. Because I, I have a hunch we're going to probably have to really take the chisel out in some areas and try to find some. Our, our anticipated levy increase is very minimal. So if, if our calculations are correct, but mm -hmm. hopefully they're not. <laughs> yeah. And right now with all the things that we have, that we could be looking at an 11, 12% yeah. proposed increase. <laughs> I did once, but that's what so I thought. It took a long mistake. time. <laughs> well, we both oh. went through an independent thing, came up with very close yeah. to the same figure. Mine was right, hers was wrong, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, and and we'll we'll get some. We've really we've done a lot of follow up to try to get some of this information because we want to bring you as much organization to it as possible. So. And um, you were asking about the departments. I think at a minimum we want to hear from corrections. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you mentioned Robbie, yeah. uh, certainly social service. I don't know if public health, if you have indication there, is it the same thing with them or as, as with social service? Yes, it is. In fact, they're both kind of in the same uh, boat is that with using reserves last year, their, their, their request is, is uh, well, I mean, between the two of them, it's well over a million dollars because of the gap in it. So we'll have to look at how well, you want to do that. Visit them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Brian, you'll be next on your report. Oh, okay. And then we'll be done for the day. Okay. Are we? Yeah. Oh, well, we haven't paid the bills. Mm -hmm. And will we do so? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 The bills are paid. Well, Mr. Chair, on reports, I uh, had a discussion with Bruce Jaster and, and Tim this last week, and uh, it, it might be a, a small thing, but we wanted to run it by you. Uh, for years and years and years, they've been trapping mosquitoes in three different locations. And uh, he said nobody asked them for the information. They trap mosquitoes, they take them over, they have them tested over at, at uh, Vector Control in Fargo. But he said with the addition of the, of the workload that they have with all of the restaurants and the swimming pools and all of the food preparation, they just don't have the time. And uh, we've, I've communicated with, with uh, Kathy 
in public health, thinking that this was a public health responsibility and, and obligation, and she said no. She said, she said that has been, been done for years and years and years. It started way back when. I don't know if the state made a request looking for mosquitoes with, uh, I want to say hepatitis, but it's not hepatitis. It's uh, West, Nile. West Nile. There you go. And uh, well, I said, you know, if 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 nobody's requesting the information, um, do we need to do it? And I said I would bring it to you folks for discussion. Uh, whether you want us to continue, we will have to probably hire some temporary help or something to go out and do the collections. It's twice a week, four hours, roughly a time. What if West Nile is detected? Then what? That's 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 the point, I guess. What do you do? You detect it. It's going to be detected in Fargo as well as it's going to be detected here. Then does here. it go to the state, to the states, or to the local entity like our public health? Well, then it's a public health issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's well worthwhile to keep it. Uh, I guess I'm. If nobody's looked, been looking at it, are they are they turning it in to even public health? Uh, the results or. It's only if they have a negative negative find that they would turn it in. I it? suppose, yeah. If if uh, West Niles is detected in, the seems to me we could we could certainly uh, drop it for 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 now anyway and, and reinstate it if there's a a concern if public health needs it. I I assumed that if we were doing that, that public health was it was required by public I, health. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be a little politically sensitive. That's why I'm bringing it to you folks we to. Talk uh, to Kathy about that probably. Well, you know, I think it, it's, it's um, you know, if we're assisting other uh, entities of government in trying to determine counts as to when spraying is needed, um, Clay County doesn't have a vector control. Right. We don't charge for it. We don't have any revenue source for it. But if we have the ability to assist in obtaining those to know when counts are getting drastic or, or to where there is a West Nile, we can give it, you know, I, I think I think one of the places always, has always been in Oakport. Because mm -hmm. yep. Bruce has always told me they go out and collect them in Oakport. Yep. The fact of the matter is, is if we can provide that information to Oakport, then Oakport has their mechanism for dealing with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it's, I, I don't, I kind of agree with Wayne that I don't know that we need to eliminate it, but we certainly need to share the information that we collect. If we're not sharing the information, then then that just doesn't make any sense. But I'll tell you what, if there's any one thing that people in, in Clay County would be willing to see us spend a little nickel on, it's mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. <laughs> and um, not only, uh, I'll pass for now. Go ahead. Any other comments on this? Okay. I forgot what I was going to say. Well, and I, I kind of anticipated that, but I guess I didn't, we didn't want to drop it or continue without your additional approval of it. And, and what we'll do is we will make some arrangements and maybe even vector control for just maybe a small amount, maybe be willing to service the, uh, the Oakport one, because they use that for their information in, in determining that. The other two locations yeah. are Barnesville and Holland. I was going to say, even if the results are positive, that information should be distributed. Yeah. Okay. And it's, I think it's worth the money we spend if we do have positive. Just like if we, we purchase health insurance or life insurance, we hope we never have to use it, but we have to pay for it. And, yeah. and, and we'll move quickly on that. We figured we'd probably have to expend about $2,500 maybe for a... Do you want a consensus of this group here before you... I do, but I think we just received it. Okay, it's thank on you. enough head nods. So. Thank you very much. Uh, highway tracking, that's, you've had the presentation that we spent the most time on the last time, and so uh, um, I spent quite a bit of time with, with Rhonda and Larry and Susan in regards to the Affordable uh, Care Act the this, this last week. And uh, spent some time with Darren and Jennifer in preparation for the insurance committee that we're pre preparing some examples and things for the committee so they understand the different options that, that we talked about the last committee meeting. Uh, we had management team meeting went well. We talked about uh, the various aspects of personnel issues, had a little training and things. Um, also had some contacts or contact or two in regards to the August 1st issue again in regards to the uh, the marriage thing uh, amendment on August 1st. And we keep dealing with that just a little bit. 
Um, nothing's changed there. I explained that it was a court decision and, and uh, we support the courts in that. So uh, attended the county fair and that was on the heel of the, uh, we had land management in the afternoon and then the diversion board meeting in the, um, later on in the afternoon and I don't really think there's any, any issues that weren't covered by these two gentlemen for their question. John, Brad, did you feel that the uh, Thursday evening was preferable to the Wednesday afternoon for the uh, I thought, yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I thought there was an awful good crowd out at that fair uh, Thursday evening, but there wasn't a lot of people stopping by the booths. I sure. mean, uh, they were available. There was few that stopped by, asked some questions. But I think, and we talked about this, that being available is probably good. It's nice that there's probably not a lot of questions, not a lot of complaints, not a lot of concerns. Because I think people would take the time to, to look us up. They were kept announcing all evening that it was government night, and we were set up right there and and things. So, uh, and I guess you guys get a good good feel of that as well when you're out to your meetings and the amount of calls you get and things. I think we don't get a lot of necessarily complaints. So, anything else, gentlemen? We're adjourned. <laughs>